live from Boston, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering OpenStack Summit 2017. Brought to you by the OpenStack Foundation, Red Hat, and additional ecosystem support. And we're back. I'm Stu Miniman, joined with my co-host, John Troyer. Happy to welcome to the program a first-time guest, Shannon McFarlane, who's Distinguished Engineer in Cis at Cisco. Shannon, I was at an event about a month ago, and Vint Cerf, you know, one of the guys, you know, seminal creator of the internet and everything, he said during his entire career, did he have any regrets? And he said the one regret that he had is that he wished he'd use IPv6 instead of IPv4. Now, OpenStack didn't make that mistake, right? They started almost from the beginning, working on the IPv6 stuff. Uh, tell us why that was kind of a critical uh, design point for, for OpenStack. Well, historically, we have always had an issue where, in many ways, like a, a security, that IPv6 has always been an afterthought of someone's deployment, and especially in the development of code. People are either in a rush, um, or they're under budget constraints, or there's no customer demand for them to generate you know, an IPv6-enabled application. And, and I think uh, we learned a lot of good lessons early on that with OpenStack, if we're building this new thing that people are going to use, that we should have some level of IPv6 support from it, uh, you know, from the get-go. And so that, that I think, was a conscientious decision. Yeah, it, it's always challenging whenever you start something, you're kind of stuck with certain, you know, the technology of the day. I mean, I, I work for a large storage infrastructure company, and 15 years ago was getting, we're getting questions on when are you supporting IPv6 to roll it out, to get it baked in the code. You know, th these things take time. Yes. So uh, maybe speak a little bit about, you know, deployments, what that means for customers, uh, how it helps them. Uh, with, with what they're doing? Well, I think the customer side is no different than the vendor side in that if they don't have something that's really you know, knocking on their door day to day as a problem statement, they don't tend to tackle it immediately um, or even proactively and, and it, it becomes a legacy problem throughout their uh, you know, deployment and IT lifecycle. Um, I think from a deployment perspective overall in the cloud um, that we're really starting to see an uptick because a lot of people were kind of uh, hesitant about you know, retrofitting their existing data center and IT environments with IPv6, and they're like, well, if we're going to move things to the cloud, and those cloud things may have IPv6 in them, um, and maybe we're moving from a legacy application framework to a cloud native framework, that would be our first step into IPv6, because we're building this app uh, infrastructure, uh, you know, potentially in the public cloud, for example, from scratch. Um, and so a lot of people on the deployment side have kind of waited to move some of these workloads um, into the cloud and also adopt IPv6 there at the same time. And so I think that's been uh, kind of a, a part of the momentum there. Well, you talked about an uptick. Do you, can you tell us anything about the current state of IPv6 uh, deployments in, in the production cloud? Yeah, so th there's kind of two views of, of where things are in the production cloud. So the first one is on the public side. Um, I mean, I know that we have, you know, a lot of support, I, you know, in IPv6 uh, around Amazon, uh, Microsoft Azure is getting there, Google is, is behind in, in some ways. Supporting it, our people but, actually but using it. But they're gapping in. Yeah, and it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to deploy it on the production side if the cloud provider doesn't support it. Um, I will tell you that we spent a lot of time on the OpenStack deployment side, especially in the private cloud environment, um, where people are absolutely moving to, to IPv6 in, in a pretty rapid fashion. Um, so that the uptick on the OpenStack side has been uh, monumental really since the Mataka release. We have really had a, a huge uptick in people deploying it on the tenant side. I, I think people don't realize how much IPv6 is really out there. I think a lot of times, my perception, you know, homegrown IT folks in their own data centers, right? That's what they've been used to. That's what we all grew up with. They don't really see a lot of, they see a lot of uh, IPv4 endpoints, right? A lot of IP addresses. And they don't realize that the whole network all these phones, it's all running IPv6 in the, you know, behind the scenes, and I might not see it. So what does, a, what does an IT or network admi administrator uh, in the enterprise right now, uh, is IPv6 still scary for them? What are they going to need to know to, to move towards there? Well, I think uh, it's as scary as someone coming back from a CIO uh, to, or even a CFO perspective and saying, thou shalt go do public cloud. I think the fear factor has always been there is we're running out of IPv4 address space. I can't expand my, mo my mobile network to your, your point about the phone. I can't expand into other geographies because there's no publicly routable IPv4 space to be obtained in those spaces. So I think that there's still this driven fear factor that people have 
um, around, we're running out or have run out of IPv4, you've got to go do it. And a lot of it does not come from the in, internal technology side, as you mentioned. It comes from some exterior force. Um, and it's generally somebody that counts money for a living that generally brings that fear into the IT environment. So I think a lot of it has been uh, defensive driven types of movements. Uh, but we see definitely on the IT side now where um, they're having to deal with mergers and acquisitions, uh, where they have colliding IPv4 address spaces, even though there's an abundance of it, they do have a collision of those address spaces and that has caused kind of a niche uh, deployment of IPv6 internally. Um, and I think the movement of the ability to have uh, workloads represent your company's products on the public internet um, has also been a, a driving factor for people to say, okay, well, I need people that are on IPv6 to consume my products and services the same way they were kind of in the oldish or the IPv4 world. And that has also kind of driven the internal teams to, to start adopting it. Yeah, there's a lot of talk at the show about hybrid or multi-clouds. I, I have to think that would have some kind of impact on uh, pushing people towards adoption. Absolutely, so I mean, that, this is what I'm spending a, quite a bit of my time on these days is really helping customers that have either moved to public cloud and or retracting their workloads for whatever reason, whether it's a compliance or a cost or whatever the reason, uh, but, but they, have, they have consumed the public cloud things they like, API driven, elasticity, self-service provisioning, um, and deployment of IPv6 workloads on that side, and now they're bringing or connecting to their private on-prem clouds, um, and they need to have that level of protocol consistency between the two workloads. And so IPv6 in a hybrid uh, environment has absolutely become top of mind versus the we'll do this first and then we'll do IPv6 later. Um, it's absolutely a part of that. As I turn IPv6 on uh, in my infrastructure, are there still sharp edges there? Uh, should, I, should I be able to run it end to end? Is it built into most of the stack at this point? Yeah, so that's, that's an excellent point of bifurcation, if you will, of how people consume their IPv6 uh, uh, deployment requirements. Um, right now, the vast majority of the deployments, especially inside the enterprise space, has really been tenant facing. Uh, what I call kind of the data plane of the cloud, where um, I've got workloads that need to be on the outside world. They could be mobile facing or just generic in, or even internal facing. Um, and IPv6 has really been the focus in that tenant domain, less so on the actual operation or the, the, the control plane of the, of the cloud. Uh, that is starting to pick up because people have learned in many ways not to put IPv6 on after they deploy a massive cloud, uh, but to do it as, a, as a, you know, uh, a, a core part of their design philosophy. And so I think we're starting to pick up um, more IPv6 exposure in the, in the control plane, and that is really revealing the sharp edges, as you said, uh, because a lot of things like database endpoints and high availability and uh, replication and backup and logging, those types of things um, are not well tested in the control plane of clouds. Uh, but I think from a tenant perspective, uh, a, a good deal of our uh, resistance to IPv6 deployment is, is kind of behind us there. We're here at OpenStack Summit, um, you know, the topic of OpenStack. One of the themes that's emerging is that mm, OpenStack may be no longer a science project, no longer needs a whole team of Linux scientists to get working. Do I still need a, a network engineer on my team, and how, how, how OpenStack savvy do they need to be as you go out to customer deployments? I mean, here we just talked about, well, the network engineer can turn on, can turn it on, but still the uh, the infrastructure's team has to know about uh, to make sure their HA works and make sure all their availability tools still work. Yeah. So anytime any individual, whether it's a network administrator, <laughs> or a security admin, whoever it is, is touching uh, a defining element of their entire cloud, such as the internet protocol that they're running on, um, you have to be savvy with that, and that can't that goes all the way from a developer to a uh, uh, an ops engineer to, to you know, somebody that actually is paying bills and needs to understand um, you know, where logging and metrics and those types of things uh, incur some sort of cost structure. Um, so yes, I believe that, that uh, because IPv6 is a, is a, a very network facing thing that you need network facing <laughs> people sure. uh, to, to deal with that. And, and I think that what, what it is exposing, um, back to your sharp edges point, is that 
automation is crucial to what we do in the cloud. And what we're finding is that historically in the IPv6 implementation life cycles, it's been very by hand because people have not had this end-to-end -end capability of deploying IPv6 everywhere day one. So they've had to by hand deploy it maybe in some switches and in some routers and some firewalls and there's not been this end-to-end -end continuity. Um, now that they kind of have that exposure and they're moving to the cloud, they need to ensure that that capability exists in the automation uh, tools that they have. And so even the, po the folks that are building uh, the deployment uh, structure of their cloud need to, to have that capability. So again, that goes right down to network folks that are helping with that. Yeah. Shannon, are there any special considerations for the service providers that are looking at this space? Yeah, so on the service provider side, there's, there's kind of two things. One, back to your mobile point, is it is what I'm running my business on. So if I don't have routable address structure to run uh, you know, uh, a, a telephone uh, from a, an endpoint perspective, that's a problem. The other one is if I am a service provider that is hosting someone else's content, uh, maybe a cloud, a public uh, uh, cloud service provider that is routing um, traffic to and from an enterprise that happens to be in the cloud, they need to consider IPv6. Uh, I think I was just at the North American IPv6 Summit uh, two weeks ago, and uh, T-Mobile and Comcast and these guys were all talking about um, how IPv6 enabled they were, and, and one of the great talks was around T-Mobile, is the fact that if you're a T-Mobile customer today, you are running IPv6 on your handset, and if you need to go to an IPv4 only world, they will translate you there. Um, but it, it's, it's here and it's alive and well, and, and the beauty of what we're trying to accomplish with a real IPv6 deployment is the fact that the user shouldn't know which protocol they're running on. They should just have the same experience that, that the application developer intended. And so I think um, the carrier side and then the, the routing of uh, things between two points on the internet are, are top considerations for the service provider. Okay, uh, Shannon, the last question I have for you, uh, uh, what are some of the conversations you're having around the show? Uh, what are some of the kind of the main points that you'd want people taking away from uh, this event? Yeah, I think we're focused on what do we do next. Uh, I think we've got really strong support in OpenStack today. I mean, we've, we've done uh, a lot of work around getting IPv6 enabled in such a way that um, that we have it in, in the vast majority of the projects, Neutron, and the ability to do things in the Horizon dashboard and those types of things. But what is it that the customers are still uh, feeling from a friction in deployment? And so I think that the, the goals of moving forward is, is how do we make sure that the control plane, uh, the databases, and the API endpoints, and those types of things have, have IPv6 support. And we need to also, I think, as an entire community, understand what people are doing with OpenStack or want to do with OpenStack. And, and when we kind of understand what their use cases are, then we can kind of bolt on um, any additional support that IPv6 may, may be able to help them down that road. Right. Shannon McFarlane, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome to being a CUBE alum now. And we'll be back with lots more coverage here from OpenStack 20, Summit 2017. You're watching theCUBE.